All right, good morning. Hola. Good morning. Can you have your Bible open up to Genesis 1 again? It's going to be a little overlap. Genesis 1. Verse down, or excuse me, go down to verse... 26 it says, and God, let, and God said, Let us make man in our image and after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. Uh, well, and then God. Bless them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful, multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. Then go down to chapter 2, um, and then verse 7. It says, The Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. And then he would have planted him uh, east of the garden. Right, so uh, go to Psalm 101. Psalm 101. Mm -hmm. Last week we looked in particular as far as stuff that pertained just strictly to the woman, and then this week we're going to be looking at. Uh, Basically, what's uh, pertaining to the to the man. Um, this would be under embracing your identity, and then also in uh, playing your role. And it's gonna well embracing your identity. We'll start with that. It says, okay, after World War II, American culture uh, succeeded in promoting the idea that masculinity, the male role, is promiscuity, and that femininity. Uh, the female role is chastity. Then in the 1960s, the sexual revolution, quote unquote, supposedly set everyone free to be promiscuous. After all, the girls could be just as good as the boys, right? Uh, enter feminism, the homosexual movement, and gender confusion. Uh, but a Christian who understands his identity based on authority must recognize uh, the moral boundaries established by that authority as well. Uh, and then we have God has two purposes, basically, in our identity, that being morality, which we've already addressed and in his glory, which we are we had kind of addressed early on. Uh, in playing your role, um, okay. the male and female are to play different roles in God's creation, or, or excuse me, that male and female are to play different roles in God's creation was evident from the beginning. Uh, the creation mandate and the fact that there are two parties involved in Fulfilling it, male and female point to the fact that each had a part to play. For example, the command to be fruitful and multiply, coupled with the fact that there were uh, male and female, requires that each play a different, distinct role in order to fulfill that command. One would father a child, one would bear the child. Um, so the female, we already looked at the male, it says the masculine role as God intended it uh, can be summed up in two words leader and provider. Okay, male is a leader. God's intention for male headship role as leader is confirmed by several important facts. First, the entire human race was named man, and God said, let us make man in our image. Uh, Genesis 126 emphasis added on the word man. Okay, this statement also is also repeated in Genesis 5.1. Then uh, Genesis 5.2 takes the case even further by stating male and female created he them. That's a typo. It'd be, it's actually two. A uh, male and female created he them and blessed them and called their name Adam in the day that uh, when they were created. Okay, um, by identifying the entire human race with the title man and by recognizing the male female relationship with Adam's name, God showed that he intended the male to be the head, especially in relation with the woman. Second, the man named the woman. And uh, Adam said, This is not one of my bones and flesh of my flesh, she shall be called woman because she was taken out of the man in Genesis 2.23. This is after he was awakened out of the sleep. And uh, God had presented uh, her to him. Okay, Adam had previously exercised his role as head of God's creation by naming all the animals. Uh, this he did at God's behest 
that he find a help meet for him or a helper that was suitable for him. Eve, who unlike the animals, was a suitable helper for Adam, as she stands before him, he exercises that naming authority with her. Uh, surely this is an expression of Adam's sense of his role as leader. Uh, not only that, but Adam's first act of obedience after the curse, a result of his forfeiting his headship, was to reclaim his role as leader by renaming his wife Eve in light of God's new promise of a coming seed. Uh, Genesis 3.20. Okay, third, Adam bears the blame for the whole calamity of sin. Wherefore, as by one man, sin entered the world and death by sin, so that so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Genesis, or excuse me, Genesis. Romans 5.12. When God returned to the garden, uh, he called for Adam in Genesis 3.9, and though the woman receives a curse because of sin, a reason for Adam's curse is plainly stated, because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife. Genesis 3.17. Okay, Adam surrendered his rightful role as a leader to his wife, allowing disobedience to God's command. He bore the responsibility of sin because he had the responsibility to lead. Okay, fourth, the New Testament reaffirms the intent of creation that man should lead. And this is out of 1 Corinthians 11.3, but I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ. Morning. Um, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. And in, in 1 Timothy 2, 12-13, uh, it says, But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence, for Adam was first born, then Eve. Okay, these passages deal with authority in the church, not marriage. Uh, what is especially clear from the 1 Corinthians passage is that the leadership role uh, does not equal superiority, but authority. Um, God the Father occupies a higher authority than the Son, just as the man occupies a place of authority higher than the woman. Uh, the issue is not superiority versus inferiority. It is simply a matter of position uh, in an authority structure. In 1 Timothy, Paul sees the role of a teacher uh, as a position of authority. Therefore, it would be contradictory to God's original intent, since Adam was first formed, for the woman to occupy that position over a man. Uh, creative order signifies creative intent. As a leader, a man should take the initiative in decision-making, planning, discipline of children, ministry, intimacy with his wife, etc. In short, he should take charge. Okay, too many men are guilty of passivity and fail to fulfill this aspect of their God-given role. All right, I know that's a lot and kind of a mouthful, but you guys understand what he's getting at here? Or what's being affirmed? Basically, he's just trying to show from um, God's command in Genesis his intent. Uh, so it's pretty clear, and it just shows that he's just addressing the fact that the, the, the male is created as a leader, and that because of the fall, now there's going to be a contention, uh, which was addressed in the curse. But the fact is, it still doesn't change God's intent or God's mind in the fact that he had created Adam first and that he, he's a leader. It's, again, not an issue of he's better than or um, superior, but rather that's, that's God's intended role. That was God's design for him. Does anybody have any questions on that? Yes? The world's uh, media is going just the opposite. <laughs> yeah, well, it is. It is. It uh, tries very hard to try to eliminate any of those they well I think we understand this it, basically they hate God so anything that God would be for or God would affirm uh, they try to do away with just as a sign you know basically a rebellion to say you know you're not the boss we are kind of thing <laughs> but it's, yes well, like it says in Galatians we're all equal in Christ male female Jew Greek etc uh, but it's just not equal in authority but we are equal as individuals. Yes. And <laughs> I want to say no. The that, that, you know, he's not, the pastor is equal to all of this. He's not our overlord, but he has authority to, to the pastor. Right? Like, which I think like yeah. The apostles have authority that other people don't have. But that doesn't mean they're better than they're not. The only argument I would have against that and it's probably semantical, is simply 
were not equal. Equal. Like, in other words, we're crew. It's the first Corinthians 12. No, 1 Corinthians 12 to 14 because of the different roles. Or the gifting of God, basically, is what I it's, it's, yeah, you're saying equal in worth, not equal in capabilities or yeah. responsibilities. Or yes. And in all honesty, we're all level at the foot of the cross. Yeah. So, but yes, That's right. it's a good point. <laughs> That's a really good point. Um, okay, so male, any statements or questions again? All right, male is provider. Uh, working in order to provide was built into the male role from the beginning. And the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and keep it. Okay, when, uh, that's Genesis 2.15. When God placed Adam into the garden, he told him that he could freely partake of all the trees of the garden except for the one. Uh, the work of tending the garden was rewarded with the enjoyment of partaking of the garden. Now, we see that same concept reiterated again and again and again. You see it initially in the law. Uh, but you, I mean, there's other places where you have example of it and where the principle is stated, but the actual command itself, you see it, uh, if I'm not mistaken, and if, if I am, please correct me on that. It's first that you see it uh, clearly just outright stated in, in, the, in, in, in the law in Leviticus as far as thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn. And again, Paul uses that in 1 Corinthians 9, uh, speaking of basically those that preach the gospel should live of the gospel and that he who plants you know has that expectation that he's going to be a partaker of that which he planted you know so the worker you know labor not not only worthy of his hire but the fact is that you plant and hope you thresh and hope you you labor with an expectation to be a partaker so um, that's not that's not you uh, but that's something that I guess I never really kind of thought about. Okay, even just from the beginning, the fact that Adam had that, and that was, you know, Adam's privilege, and being one that worked in the garden, you could freely take of whatever you wanted there, since you're the one tending it. Um, okay, in his partaking of the garden, Adam would have to. Adam would have no doubt shared with his wife and children. God's curse on Adam reaffirms that he was considered the primary uh, breadwinner. Work was not a result of the curse, a uh, difficulty was, or the diminishing aspect of, of labor, uh, you know, where you're, you're drained of your energy and that kind of thing, uh, besides the pain. Okay, gen uh, together, Genesis 2.15 and Genesis 3.18, where God tells Adam he would now eat bread by the sweat of his brow, uh, make clear that Genesis 1. 28 command to subdue the earth was specifically meant for the male role. Uh, this is not to say that a woman working outside the home is unbiblical. We will address this issue when we consider the female role. Uh, nor does it question a woman's ability to work, but it cannot be disputed that the role most responsible for the work and provision for the family was intended to be the man. Okay, as a provider, a man should work for the financial well-being and sustenance of his family and should consider how else he can contribute to their needs, protection of wife and children, uh, wife's need for intimacy, etc. The leader provider role uh, is God's original intent for the male gender, especially in relation to a female. Any mistreatment of women or children, verbal, physical, or sexual, etc., is a direct violation of God's intent for the male role. Okay, so. Um, basically. A lot of what, well, certain certain aspects in our culture, certain segments, certain groups, I should say, uh, will look at people who abuse their authority, and then they want to make it as a blanket. They they want to broad brush everybody else uh, with that, uh, just because of certain people's excesses, and that. There is the possibility for that, but then you wouldn't be, you know, if you're doing that, then you're not living according to what God wants for you anyways. Uh, but it doesn't diminish, it doesn't take away the fact that uh, the man should be the provider. Uh, and that basically God's intent for, for man was to work as far as the, the male um, and for him to, to be the primary. 
and then uh, it says, age and marital status will dictate its practical expression, but any man seeking to fulfill his God-given responsibility uh, must take his role seriously. All right, does anybody have any questions on that? All right, I had asked for those who uh, came in early. We're in Psalm 101. Psalm 101. Uh, Psalm 101. Okay. Um, the Psalm of David. I will sing of mercy and judgment unto thee, O Lord, will I sing. Uh, I will behave myself wisely in a perfect way. O when wilt thou come unto me? I will walk within my house with a perfect heart. I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. I hate the work of them that turn aside. It shall not cleave to me. A forward heart shall depart from me. I will not know a wicked person. Whoso privily slandereth his neighbor, him will I cut off. Um, him that hath an high look and a proud heart will not I suffer. Mine eyes shall be upon the faithful of the land, that they may dwell with me. He that walketh in a perfect way, he shall serve me. Uh, he that worketh deceit shall not dwell within my house. Uh, he that telleth lies shall not tarry in my sight. I will early destroy all the wicked of the land, that I may cut off all the wicked doers from the city of the Lord. All right. Now, you're asking why are we reading this? All right. In particular, um, <laughs> this this is pretty interesting. Now, this isn't, I would say, exclusive to man, but it is primarily. I'm going to be applying it to man if we're going to be biblical as far as men, since we're addressing the men today in particular. Um, these would be uh, checklists, I guess you could say, of, of many that we're going to find in Scripture of how we should be, if this is what should characterize us as men. Okay, And a lot of what he addressed in particular as far as being a provider, being a leader, uh, well, more so being a, being a leader, uh, and an influencer uh, for right, for, for, for God's glory, uh, is affected a lot by uh, what we see in here. Um, <laughs> it's funny, I've read this, uh, I don't know how many times, but I never had it really applied to, I had, um, when I was in college, uh, the president of our college, his wife was invited by the president to speak to the men. We had a class called Preacher Boys, and it's basically where you have uh, usually the president of the college that would speak to us on different subjects and then he would have invited guests to come in and that they would deal with something in particular that he felt would be helpful to us, to the guys. And then the ladies would have Christian women. His wife would be the one that would be primarily teaching that. So anyway, so he had invited her to come to address us there in that class. And then kind of how guys use Proverbs 31 as a checklist for, okay, this is the kind of girl I look for. Well, that's kind of what she did. She used Psalm 101 uh, for as a checklist. Okay, this is girls. If you look for a guy, look for a guy that's like this. So that kind of where I got that concept. But uh, it says, okay, I will behave myself wisely in a perfect way. This is verse 2. I will walk within my house. I will set no wicked thing before my eyes. Okay, I hate the work of them that turn aside, it shall not cleave unto me. Okay, a froward heart shall depart from me. I will know, I will not know a wicked person. Um, so now notice throughout this, okay, there's eight verses, and he, he has at least almost double that of commands that he says, I will, I will, I will, I will, I will. These are predetermined choices uh, of his will that he's seeking to fulfill and it's largely so that he would be pleasing unto the Lord so he's recognizing the fact that God has authority over his life he's recognizing the fact that um, he's here for the purpose of being able to glorify God and please God and he also recognizes that without a relationship no mind you because this is this would be the primary motivation uh, without a relationship for God then he's practically going to be useless um, I don't mean just in his work, but in his ability to be able to go ahead and lead his household aright. And so, notice some of the things that he points out here. Um, behaving himself wisely in a perfect way. Okay, so how is that accomplished practically?
okay, I'm going to walk within my house with a perfect heart. Okay, so um, those that are closest to me ought to be able to go ahead and see that I'm not a different person outside the home than I am in the home. All right, there's going to be a consistency there. Uh, he's going to some of the things here. He says he's going to set no wicked thing. Uh, before his eyes. I hate the work of them that turn aside or shall not cleave unto me. So beyond just what he lets into his eyes, it's whatever he lets uh, influence him. Like in Psalm 1, that, uh, you know, blessed the man that he walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth the way sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But instead his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law does he meditate day and night. And because of that, he's going to be like the tree that plant, that's planted by the rivers of water. So in other words, he doesn't allow the influence of that which is ungodly. He's not going to allow the influence of that which is wicked uh, to come into him as much as he possibly can. Uh, froward heart shall depart from me, and will not know a wicked person. Notice, a froward heart. What does Jeremiah have to say about that? Well, I know Proverbs speaks of forwardness and froward heart quite often. Jeremiah in particular just says, that the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked, right? Who could know it? Yes. What does what froward mean? Uh, as far as the Hebrew word itself, it is like profane, evil, or twisted. But in English, it also has the idea of like you know, this is this is bad. Like you, it's negative. Uh, it's not just having like a, you know a negative. Attitude, but it's also just you would um, you would um, you you'd be like turn aside, twisted. Yeah, okay. So, in in a sense, similar to kind of like perverted, oh, okay. but perverted at least in American culture has the the idea of like sexual, you know. But it's not just limited to sexual. It's like anything that's twisted that's wrong. You know, you can see, well, you see it expressed a lot in, like, the sexual stuff, like the transgender and all that stuff. So you got somebody that, they're a man, but because of self-esteem issues and all that kind of stuff, they, they think to themselves, okay, I'm, I'm really a woman. So that's like, that's, okay, that's wrong, that's twisted. But you can, it, it, it's not limited to that. It, it could be any kind of twisting or perverting, you know. Uh, any, basically, any turning aside, uh, any anything that would call right wrong, wrong right. Um, but in our culture, we see it a lot, as far as that, um, the, the sexual expression of that. Okay, so forward heart shall depart from me. I will not know a wicked person. So he's not going to let the negativity or the negative influence or the ungodly influence be um, controlling him or dictating him. Uh, okay, who's so privileged slander with his neighbor? Him will I cut off. Uh, him that hath an high look and a proud heart will I not suffer. Okay, my eyes shall be upon the faithful of the land, and they the, that they may dwell with me. He that walketh in a perfect way, he shall serve me. Okay, so rather than being with those that are wicked, that are ungodly, rather than being in the way with them, rather he's going to go and seek out those that want to have a heart for God. Okay, so in other words, he's going to purposely isolate himself or rather um, what's the word <laughs> he's got to insulate himself protect from protect himself yeah because the fact is evil communications corrupt good manners so that which you hang around that which you let influence you uh, eventually is going to come out into your life okay and so you have to be guarded now mind you we are to be in the world but not of it we're to be salt and light. Okay, so Paul addresses that in First Corinthians, particularly that, you know, we're not to company with those, but at the same time, we can't just like, if we wouldn't company with anybody, then we, we'd all together be out of the world. You know, we, our purpose is to engage the corruption and the ungodly. God wants to win them, all right? They're not the enemy. The Satan is, okay? The devil is the demonic forces. That's the enemy. Right? And so those folks may be given over to his influence. Uh, they may either through blindness or just outright because of hate towards God 
you know, are given over to reprobate mind, and so uh, they're doing those things which are inconvenient, or as, as it tells us in Romans 1. So they, you know, allow themselves to, to be exploited by the devil. Uh, but the fact is God still wants to win them. God still loves them. And so <laughs> we have to have a heart for them to want to reach them. Uh, we, we, have to be, we have to be guarded against them their influence on us. We should seek to influence them, not have them influence us. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, okay, he that worketh deceit shall not dwell within my house. Uh, he that telleth lies shall not tarry in my sight. Note, uh, he keeps speaking of the fact that uh, he's not only going to walk within his house, but he's not going to let those influences inside his house. Now, how many people are in his house? Granted, this is David that wrote this, right? Yeah. Now, how good was he at doing that, though? <laughs> yeah, he wasn't very successful. Um, he, yeah, he was inconsistent in a lot of ways. Um, primarily... I think of the sin with Bathsheba, but there was other areas as well uh, where he um, he was he was disobedient, and as a result, you see the outcome of that. And then you, I can't argue the fact is it's kind of hard to want to to take this this like, well, David wrote this, but the fact is it's inspired scripture from the Lord, so he used David as a tool to be able to go ahead and, and communicate it to us, and though he may have been a failure personally, that doesn't mean that we have to be. Okay, we can take what's written, what God says of this, and of his heart when he was right before him, and we can adopt it, and we can live it, and we can uh, see God bless in our life, even though everybody else may not, or they may choose not to. The fact is I can. I can still have God blessing in my life if I choose, to, you know, if I pursue that. So it's not, I'm not obstructed from that. There's no hindrance from that. Does that make sense? All right. Does anybody have any questions? So as men, this ought to be a pattern. This ought to be, I mean, this isn't the only one, but this ought to be a pattern for us. Uh, this is something, this isn't limited to young men, but I'm going to read, there's a book by a gentleman by the name of Pastor Jerry Ross, uh, 21 Tenets of Biblical Masculinity. He, did, he had one for the women as well. Okay? Um, and it's intended primarily, he's kind of, he's a pastor, but he was a youth pastor, and so it's intended for, like, youth group, but it's applicable to everybody. Let me just read the tenets real quick. But there's a few things here that I wanted to just kind of read through that were uh, really applicable as far as for the men. It says, okay, as far as the 21, okay, young men must embrace opportunities to develop their natural <coughs> strength and the performance of physical labor. Young men should master a marketable wage-earning trade in their youth. Okay, young men should be assigned jobs that require courage. Young men should never abuse an, uh, an assigned position of authority by using it for selfish gain or self-gratification. Uh, young men should be trained in proper communication. That is actually a really good chapter because he addresses as far as our speech. Uh, it's supposed to, we're supposed to be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath, and then we're supposed to be guarded in how we, in how we speak. Um, okay, young men should not hesitate to draw their swords against evil. Okay, young men should seek counsel from his elders, not his peers. Okay, young men should consistently praise the Lord. Young men should remember that no matter how physically strong they are, uh, a far superior supernatural strength can be accessed by learning to wait upon the Lord. Okay, young men, young men should seek God in their youth with the understanding that the God-young man relationship may be the most potent available to them in their lifetime. Now, um, not all of us came to God as children. So the fact is where you're at in your walk, seek God now. But it is a principle that is very clearly stated in Ecclesiastes that uh, remember now the Creator and now youth. Because the fact is you're not, our lifespan is so short uh, you want to take every available opportunity that you can. And then when you're younger, just on a practical level, the fact is you have more energy, more strength, and more ability than you do when you're older. 
a lot of times when we get older, uh, we have injuries that crop up and then our health isn't in, uh, the greatest and, and, and we don't have the ability that we had or even the strength that we had as when we were younger. And so we're not able to do as much, even though we have the desire, our body may not have the capability as we would have when we were younger. So it's just wise if you come to, if you come to Christ as a child, seek to serve him now. And the, the best time just to service is now. We don't have a whole lot of time. Uh, young men uh, should seek his spirit vision. Okay, that sounds kind of creepy, but basically he's saying, we'd have to read it to, to get his understanding of what he's trying to say there, but basically, in other words, you, you seek God's will. You want God to be the one that's leading you and guiding you. Uh, not, you know, you don't go off on your own uh, passions or your desires, but rather that you have God's will as what's guiding you preeminent. Okay, young men should understand that God called out from their ranks uh, his prophets in every generation. Okay, young men should learn from the aged men four disciplines of Christian maturity. Disciplined thinking, reputable living, pure convictions, and excellent speech. Okay, young men should master three vital masculine skills, overcoming satanic attacks, developing spiritual strength, and internalizing scriptural truth. Young men must learn to face and defeat giants. Young men must learn that there are sins linked to youthfulness that will cause them great struggles. <coughs> okay, that's... <laughs> That's an important one. Okay, young men should uh, practice chivalry. A young man should marry in his youth and should discover all the pleasures of women through one woman, the wife of his youth. Okay, so he's addressing the fact there that it's never okay to be promiscuous at all. I don't know where we get that. Well, culturally, we got that idea, but the fact is it's God's intended. If you're to marry, then you're to marry your wife, and then, you know, you never, there's never any uh, room for anything beyond, you know, any any activity outside of marriage is condemned by God, and he says that um, in Hebrews, that marriage is honorable and all, and the bed undefiled, but four mongers and adulterers God will judge, you know, so, <laughs> trust me, you don't want to find out what that is, God's judgment on you for that. Um, a young man, uh, young men should understand the importance of bearing a yoke in their youth and the danger of unequal yoke. Okay, young men should counter the natural inclination of older men to undervalue their youthfulness by showing stellar character in six important areas. Uh, excellent speech, mature behavior, selfless love, good attitude, sincere faith, and, sincere faith, and wholesome purity. And then uh, young men should absorb the wisdom found in the book of Proverbs. Um, there's a few that I'm going to go through here. Uh, Titus chapter 2. Titus 2. But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine, that the aged men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, in charity, in patience. Okay, so that's, again, part of what he desires for us. That's what we should be striving to be. And that, as we become aged, uh, or as we are aging, should be something that we ought to be developing and pursuing in. Uh, and that is that we are to be sober-minded. We're supposed to be grave. Now, grave is more serious, but it's not that you can't laugh or have fun. Basically, you're going to be spiritually focused, spiritually minded, eternally minded, eternally focused, okay? Your, your priorities are going to be that which is godly, uh, which is what's going to impact for eternity. Um, sound in faith and charity and patience. Okay, sound, the idea is healthy. So, in your faith, in your charity, and in your patience, okay, that is something that should be highly developed as you age. If you, as a young man, now that's not an excuse for a young man to not be patient, not be sound in their faith, or not be loving. Uh, but the fact is that that is something that should characterize us. Um, go, go down to verse six, it says, young men likewise exhort to be sober-minded Okay, in all, in, all, in all things showing thyself a pattern of good works, in doctrine showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity, okay, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that he, may, uh, that, he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed. 
uh, having no evil thing to say of you. Okay, so that's something else that should characterize this. Even now, the older men, it's a, it should, it's a kind of understood. Okay, you would already have developed in this area, but if you aren't, then seek to develop. You know, repent of that and then adopt God's mindset on it. But sober-minded is something that's very important. And then uh, showing yourself a pattern of good works. Good doctrine is going to show itself as well as bad doctrine in the fruit that it produces. And the fruit that it produces should be a healthy lifestyle. Okay? And by healthy, I don't mean just, okay, physical health. I'm talking about just spiritual health. Uh, we should have integrity. We should have character. We should have... Uh, things of which it speaks here uh, are speech, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that he which is of the contrary part may be ashamed. In other words, and, uh, there's another portion of scripture that speaks of when that they will lie <coughs> concerning you uh, because they don't have anything of which to accuse you of. So in other words, there's nothing that, I like to think of it as you being a, a Teflon, Teflon coated. Okay, Teflon. If you're, if you guys are familiar with what that is, is a chemical compound. Yes, um, and nothing sticks to it. Okay, so you're going to be attacked. You're going to have the devil and those that are influenced by him or given over to, uh, con you know, given over control to him uh, in their life. Uh, accuse you of all sorts of things, um, and there shouldn't be anything in our life. That would stick. In other words, there's not going to, there shouldn't be. If we're, if we're living right, if we're doing right, we're seeking to uh, live like God wants us to live. Then nothing of what uh, is railed against us would have any kind of handle or foothold uh, for anybody to be able to go ahead and say, "Well, okay, well, that I can see where that could be the case, or I can see where that could be the case in this person's life." You know, our life, our life should be that, that clean and that holy. Um, Twenty and then almost in. <coughs> okay. Um, in First Timothy four it says Lo, uh, four twelve. Okay. Lo, let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. Okay. Here's a fact: older men sometimes undervalue and underestimate the importance of, and potential of young men. They probably shouldn't, but they do. Paul warned Timothy of this danger. He also placed on this young man the responsibility of living in such a way to gain the respect of his elders. Right now you have the reputation among godly adults. Adults watch young people. They base their assessment of you by examining six areas of your life. These six areas you are commanded by God to be an example of what a believer is supposed to be in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. Okay? Um, and I'm just going to touch upon them, the way he words them, just because it, I like the way he worded them. It says that adults respect excellent speech. Adults respect mature behavior. Okay, Adults respect selfless love. Adults respect sincere faith. And then uh, adults respect wholesome purity. Now that's commanded to Timothy in particular because he was pastoring a church. And he was chronologically younger than many of the men that were there. And so um, he was also commanded that he's supposed to rebuke a lot of the folks that were there, just rebuke the church in certain areas. Um, being human nature what it is, a lot of times folks don't well receive that. In the first accusation, they're going to rail against him because he was chronologically younger than a lot of the folks there were. Well, what do you know? You're just a young kid. You know? And so, um, Paul's advice to him, or Paul's command to him was, let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example. So in other words, it's, they, they, they still might accuse you, they still might uh, push back or fight against you for when you rebuke them, but the fact is, uh, you're word, your conversation, and charity, and spirit, and faith, and in purity, uh, if you're exemplary in these areas, you're not, you know, it's, <laughs> one, it, it's, high, it's higher probability that they'll better receive it, but ultimately it comes down to whether or not they're going to be obedient to the Lord, uh, but also, too, it, it also, 
is a safeguard against attack. Um, and so these are areas that we, as I good morning, we as men ought to now. That could kind of cross over somewhat to women as well. It's not that women shouldn't be guarded in the way they speak or in their conversation or in their in their spirit or in their charity as well. But the fact is, that since we're particularly, and this was particularly toward men, um, this is something that was important that we sh that should characterize us uh, as Christian men. And if we're to be biblical, these are areas that we need to focus on and we need to make sure that hey, um, if we don't match up, then you know repent of that. And then adopt God's attitude, and then say, "Lord, help me, help me to be like this. Help me to live like this. Help me be somebody that is exemplary in how I carry myself, in uh, my my speech, my conversation, uh, in my charity, in my spirit, in my faith, in my purity." All right. Uh, does anybody have any questions? Yes. This isn't a question, but I'd like to say that uh, before I was saved, I was at a big church, you know, and <clears throat> many of the people there, uh, for their appearance, were very nice and uh, proper, I'd say more proper, <laughs> and uh, I went to this Bible study, and there I met some people uh, that were very genuine, but one fellow in particular that really impressed me was a uh, football player, professional football player, and <clears throat> he was, well, he was huge, <laughs> for one thing. Uh, he was tall, and uh, but he was very mannerly, very polite, very thoughtful, uh, soft-spoken, and, uh, you know, I just, it didn't fit, didn't fit my impression of a professional football player at all, but he was a godly man. And that was a tremendous testimony to me. <laughs> it wasn't long after that that I came to know the Lord. Wow. That's neat. That's amazing. We never know what kind of influence we'll have. Uh, yes? I have a question. Now, the word conversation, uh, is that actual conversation or like you know that my Bible says conduct? Is it conversation or conduct or, so, or something in between? Your lifestyle, the way you live. So it's not just conversation as in talking? No, no, no. The actual word would like your lifestyle, how you live. Okay. I was just wondering if this okay. Yeah, no, because he addresses the word like he says in, in your word, which uh, basically would be your speech. And then in, in conversation would be like your your manner of living. Okay. All right, I was just wondering if we got no more questions then. We will continue on and then we'll we got well okay, we'll I'll try and finish up in the next few lessons. Uh, we'll f look at some well I want to look at some some ways that uh, the world perverts it, and then what 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 can we do to be able to fight against that, uh, and then hopefully hopefully equip you guys to give you answers uh, when you encounter folks that are in you know basically just influenced by the world, and so they're twisted in their thinking, and how you know how can we uh, basically how can we help them to. Not, not only know right, but also hopefully turn to right and then have God change your life. All right. So, no questions. We're dismissed.